and holy name. Amen. When I was younger, and even to this day, one of the things that kind of made me a little bit strange, a little bit odd, was that I loved to talk to adults rather than my peers. That as a child in particular, I loved to talk with my grandparents and, and kind of people on that same age level as they were more than I enjoyed having friends my own age. In particular, I really enjoyed talking to my one grandfather. And I would often go to him to seek out his wisdom. You see, by the time that I came to know my grandfather, he was already a retired Marine Corps colonel and a retired professor of mathematics. And so he had just a lot of experience in leadership and interpersonal skills and things that, that I really needed help with and how to deal with my peers. One of the peers that I most often talked with him about was my cousin, who is 20 days younger than me, and together we kind of share the, uh, the privilege or the honor of being the oldest of our generation in the family. And often my cousin and I would vie over, we'll say, control as to what the cousins would be doing. Um, so we, would, we had very different ideas. I tended to be a little bit more on the the game side of things, intellectual side, he was more of the sports type guy. And, and so we were always trying to get our younger cousins to, to come and, and do whatever activity that we wanted to do. He had the advantage being that the next youngest were his siblings. Um, but I would talk with my grandfather about how to, to maybe influence my cousins, how to get them to, to want to come and and to play the games and things that I liked, the things that, that you know, I was at least somewhat good at uh, compared to my cousin, um, rather than running out and playing basketball or something where even though I was taller, he always managed to be faster and a little bit better at shooting than I was. And my grandfather would sit me down and we would have these long conversations and we would have conversations about and my interactions at school and stuff. And, and it turns out that under my own wisdom, I, I thought that leadership and getting people to do what I wanted meant that I told them what I wanted them to do and said that they're going to do it. And that didn't seem to work really well. And, and even as a colonel in the Marine Corps, for, he, he started to try to teach me that that's not even how the Marine Corps quite does it. That, that yes, the officers do give orders to their, their subordinates, but, but before they give those orders, they have taken all this time to kind of build up a respect and a relationship with their soldiers that actually causes the soldiers beneath them to want to follow their lead, to trust that what they are going to say is the best thing. And so with my cousins, it was about building up some kind of relationship that, that when I would try to get them to come play my games or something like that, it wasn't just, we're going to play my games now, it was that, hey, this game actually is kind of fun and it might be something interesting to do that you might enjoy, and figuring out how to get them to know me and trust me well enough that, that when I tried to offer a game that was not basketball or football or something like that, that they would be willing to, to come and do that. And I found that when I listened to my grandfather's words of wisdom, life went much better, went much easier, and and lo and behold, my cousins would actually listen to me and hear what I wanted to say. And sometimes we would actually do some of the things that I liked to do. And when I didn't listen to my grandfather, it was like gears grinding against each other and the keys not lining up and nothing was working and everyone was unhappy, including me. Our scripture lesson today is a continuation of our study of Proverbs, and it talks about the security of wisdom, that the writer is trying to speak to their son, whether it's a mother or father, they're telling their son about the value of wisdom. 
and that they long for their son to have their ears open to not only hearing the wisdom that is around them, but to have their heart open to understanding it. To, that they need to not only hear what is being said, but they need to, to, to discern what it may mean and, and how to apply it in their lives. And that wisdom is something that should be sought out after, like, like silver or like a treasure. And if they do these things, if they seek out wisdom in this way, and if they open themselves up to understanding it, they can dwell securely in wisdom. That wisdom will guide them on the paths of righteousness. And it will help them become, or it will help her son or his son become a man of integrity. And keep them from straying on the paths of wickedness. And from being tempted by the perverse words of those who use them, as well as the adulteress listed in the Scripture. Now, I don't know much about adulteresses and stuff, but I do know that, like their description of the adulteress in our Proverbs, sin has a way of being very seductive. And to me, wisdom, particularly the wisdom of God, is something that we all should be seeking after and seeking to understand. And so if wisdom is something that is passed on through words, then the wisdom of God is that which is passed on through the Word of God, namely Jesus Christ, and what we have reported about Him in our book, the Bible. Now God's wisdom through Jesus Christ can be boiled down in essence to two rules. Love God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your soul, and all your body and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. Christ said that on these two commandments hang everything. And so if we look at Christ's wisdom and we were to start living our lives by, by gauging every one of our actions against these two rules. Am I loving God in this action? Or am, am I loving my neighbor as myself? in this action, that we would guard ourselves against the paths of evil. Because evil is all about ourselves, and all about doing the things that we want, the desires that we have, sometimes what we would call evil desires, of just ignoring how much what we want may hurt others, including God. And so if we were to, to listen to Christ's words, to hear them and hear him saying to love God and to love others as ourselves, and then if we were to take the next step and open ourselves up to understanding those words and realizing that, that they have a myriad of implications beyond the simple just loving, but that, that they can be applied in multiple situations and in all form and manner of actions, and that loving may be something beyond just our usual thoughts on love, but that may actually be something along the lines of making sure to care and seeking out the best for others. Then we will be seeking after something that is more precious than gold, we will, we will be searching out and seeking after the knowledge of God and the wisdom that allows us to rest securely in our salvation and in eternal life. Now I said a little bit earlier that I think that sin is seductive. It is tempting. It is something, and, I, and I'll explain a little bit more on that. Often, when we are going to sin, it's not usually the, the big sins that we worry about. I mean, I'm not talking about things like murder or seductive or something to do with. What is seductive is sometimes we get these ideas that, that we should have something. Like certain amounts of money, a promotion, a raise, or whatever. That we deserve it. And so we begin to act in ways that may undercut our, our fellow 
co-workers or, or we act in ways where we secure our own promotions or, or perhaps it's even more subtle. So perhaps it's sin begins to tempt us when, when it's something along the lines of somebody sins against us. And so sin tries to convince us you are justified in being angry and lashing out in response. And we hear that voice inside of us and we feel that anger rising within us. And we lash out. We retaliate for the wrongs that are done to us. We withhold forgiveness. And we fail to love and seek for the best for our neighbor. And it's really easy to do. There's so many times that, that we just, we tell ourselves that we don't have to help the poor because they don't deserve it and we deserve to keep our money. Or we don't have to, we don't have to end the injustices of the world because we deserve to get to use our time as we want to use it. We've worked hard and we, we want to relax rather than than making the world a better place. You see how seductive and tempting that, that sin can be? That it is kind of like this, this adulteress, this mistress that would lead us away from what Christ would call us to do, from the paths of righteousness, from doing all the possible good that we can, even if it's just keeping us from doing anything. It causes us to fall short. when we seek out God and wisdom, and when we trust in God and we understand God and we allow God's principles and God's knowledge and understanding to reign in our life, when we open ourselves up to the Holy Spirit to come and dwell within us, then we find ourselves dwelling securely in God's promises and wisdom. That God allows us to, to dwell in a world filled with sin and to, to walk into the darkness, shielded from that evil and that darkness by the light and love of Christ that surrounds our soul. And rather than worrying about whether we too will fall into the, the temptations and the, and the dredges that bring people down into death, when we seek out God's wisdom and we trust and put our confidence in it, we can walk into that darkness in His light and into those trenches and not fear that we will be led from the path of righteousness, but instead that we will be there to offer God's light to all of those who are dwelling there in that darkness. When I was a kid, I told you that I didn't always listen to my grandfather's wisdom. Sometimes I listened to what I would call the, the sin of pride in myself. And, and my grandfather would say things and give me ideas of things to do. And I would say, no, 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 you don't understand. It's really not anything that I did. It's all of their fault that they're not listening to me. That I am clearly right in the situation. And if they just see that, then everything would be okay, and I don't need to change what I do or how I present it. That sometimes when my grandfather would give me advice, I would make excuses of, well, you don't understand what's going on, and, and that may work for you, but it won't work for me in my situation. And I find that sometimes that just like when I did that with my grandfather's words of wisdom, we can do that with the Bible. And we can read the words that are there and we hear them, but we don't open ourselves up for understanding. And we assume that they may be inapplicable because they're 2,000 years old. Or that they're not applicable to us or that maybe God doesn't understand our situation or that that's great that worked for you, Jesus, but it's not going to work in my life and in my time and place. 
But what it is, is we fail to open up our hearts to understand that, that wisdom is not necessarily about just the specific words that are said. It's about the greater meaning behind them. And that when I look back, a lot of the things that my grandfather might have been telling me to do, yes, they may not have known and been covering everything that was going on in the situation, but there was some underlying principle of wisdom that he was trying to teach me that if I would have just let go of my own pride and admitted that maybe I was wrong or naive or inexperienced, and that if I listened to what he had said and tried what he tried to get me to try, perhaps slightly altered for my situation, that, that I would have been happier and would have accomplished what I had sought out to do. As we read the Bible, we need to not only see the words that are written on the pages, but we need to open ourselves up for understanding, not dismissing the words as being outdated or inapplicable, but instead seeking for the deeper meaning beneath them that may actually, in fact, lead us to living better and more righteous lives. That when we listen to Christ narrowing down the wisdom to those two simple rules, it is so that he can open up all the possibilities for all the other things that the Bible has to say that can help us understand God's wisdom. That we can open ourselves up to allow the Spirit to come in and help us to understand the words that may be written and how they may not directly apply, but how God may be saying something else that does apply. And if we open ourselves up and admit that maybe, just maybe, we're wrong. Just maybe that even if we have 90 years of experience under our belt, or 50, or 30, maybe there's still something more to learn. Or some other way of seeing the world that we haven't thought of or that we haven't experienced yet. Maybe if we can do that, And we can experience and learn and find the knowledge of God. A knowledge that will, in fact, lead us to eternal life. That will, in fact, help us dwell in security, knowing that there is nothing that this world can do to take our life and our safety in Christ away from us, our salvation, even if it throws at us pain and slings and arrogance. It cannot shake us from the foundation that is our God. I hope that as church and as individuals, we can seek after God's wisdom. That we can hear God's wisdom or read God's wisdom and open ourselves up, our hearts up to being transformed by it rather than arguing with it or against it, rather than dismissing it. And in doing so, in opening ourselves up to understanding what God is trying to teach us, that we may find God's knowledge. And that we may dwell securely in the grace of Jesus Christ, knowing that our place is in the kingdom of heaven for all eternity. And that nothing that this world can throw against us, no matter of darkness, no matter of evil or sin or death, to lead us from that place and cause us to go to strength. I hope that we are people who begin to dwell in the security of wisdom.